My name is John Tanner, and I'm really glad to be talking to you today because I'm glad to be alive. You see, I almost died, and um, I almost died needlessly. The question here is, will you die needlessly? I think everybody knows we're all going to die, but you can either live your allotted years um, or you can cut them short through your choices. And I sincerely hope that you will not choose to die needlessly. We're going to talk about heart disease and cancer, health through nutrition, and end with some strategies for success. My uh, path um, really uh, took a big turn um, a number of years ago, but the story starts five years before that, when my wife turns to me and says, John, do you know that you have the body of a god? And, you know, we've been married 25 years at that point, and she never said anything remotely like that. So I said, oh, really? I have the body of a god? She says, yes, but unfortunately, the god is Buddha. So this is not exactly the uh, physique to quest after, uh, but you have to admit there's a certain resemblance there between me and this other fellow, especially around the, the midsection. So... Um, I took that comment as uh, that maybe I needed to do something um, about the same time uh, my sister was diagnosed with diabetes and I was of the opinion that that um, ran in families. It turns out it's not genetic, but um, I didn't know that at the time. I felt I needed to do something. So I started exercising, lost a little bit of weight, started running a mile every morning and uh, that went on for about five years. I thought I was pretty healthy. I would mapped out a, a route here in my home in uh, northeast Pasadena. I would leave my house and run this blue route, end up back home a mile later. And for five years, I was fine. But on, on this particular day, October 11th, 2009, I got to point B. I was running fine, staggered a couple of steps and hit the ground unconscious with my heart stopped. This is how much warning you have of heart disease. It's a disease of the insides of your arteries. You can't see it from the outside. There's no nerve endings in there. You can't feel it. You can think you're fine and the next moment you're dead on the street. Now, fortunately I did survive uh, and I started learning some things about heart disease. I learned that it's the leading killer of men and women in this country, you probably knew that. Uh, it's, Heart disease is sometimes thought of more of a man's disease. And at the younger ages, more men die of heart disease than women do. But at older ages, more women die of heart disease than men. So uh, it really doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. If you live in this country, this is the disease that's more likely to kill you than any other disease. But you may have known that. Uh, what you may not have been so aware of is that sudden cardiac arrest is the most common form of heart disease. That is where suddenly the heart comes to a halt. Uh, there are other forms of uh, heart disease. You can have a heart attack where the heart doesn't completely stop, but it's laboring. You can have angina or angina, which is severe chest pain while the heart is still more or less beating normally, but it hurts. But of those three expressions, the uh, forms of heart disease, sudden cardiac arrest is the most common. And if that should happen to you outside of the hospital, your survival rate is about 3%. So you take all these three things together, the leading killer, the most common form of it, and a really low survival rate. And that means people are dropping dead all over the place. It, we hear about it in the press of so famous people. It wasn't too long ago, the mayor of San Francisco was fine one day and the next day he's dead of heart disease. But it's not just the famous people. Sadly, it's lots of people, our coworkers, our friends, our family members, probably everyone on this Zoom meeting today, um, knows that uh, of at least one person who was fine one day and is dead the next. So what happened to me having sudden cardiac arrest is not not unusual at all. Surviving it is a little unusual. I, I beat the 3% survival rate and I'm sincerely happy about that. Uh, but that day, this is what happened when they got me to the hospital. They got me on the operating table and uh, put the x-ray machine um, 
above me and had the doctor had a look at my heart here. The, uh, you can't see too much of the heart muscle just yet because the x-rays go right through the tissue pretty easily. Uh, the the x-rays don't go through bones so well. So you can see one of my ribs here. There's another rib down here, my spinal column along the side. But you can also see the end of this tube. This is a small plastic tube that they inserted into my heart coronary artery. They uh, cut an incision on the inside of my thigh where the femoral artery, the big artery that goes down the leg is. And they inserted this plastic tube, slid it through my arteries um, around the aorta, which is the biggest artery that comes out the top of the heart. And then it, the, the catheter, the tube made a, a turn into the small coronary arteries that come off the aorta and feed the, the heart muscle itself from the outside. The heart doesn't get nutrition or um, you know, um, oxygen from the blood that it's pumping through the middle of it. It has to, its own arteries that uh, infuse the, the muscle itself. So uh, the doctor uh, put this catheter in place so that he could see what the blood flow was like in my heart. And just before this video clip starts, the doctor pushes a foot pedal, which squirts radio opaque dye through the catheter from where it comes out of my leg, you know, and then you can see it come out the end of the tube. Radio opaque just means it's black in an x-ray. So this is what the doctor saw that day, and I want you to see if you can figure out where my problem was. Does everybody think they see the main problem? Are you maybe looking right there? It looks like from this frame of the video clip where I stopped it, it looks like there's no blood getting through that clog, but we know there's a little bit getting through or else we wouldn't see the dye down in this area. And also, by the way, I'd have been dead. That little tiny bit of blood flow was what uh, kept me alive through this, uh, this heart attack. Um, but you can also tell, even though a little bit's getting through, not much is getting through. And that was my problem that day. And as I came to find out later, and, and I'll share with you the, the, the research associated with this, I was forced to conclude that I did this to myself. And I'm sad to say that the vast majority of Americans are in the process of doing this to themselves. I would even go so far as to say, Many people who are, are listening to this are doing this to themselves, but you don't have to. And I'll share with you how you can avoid doing this to yourself. But um, if you do this to yourself, this is, you may get the same treatment I got that day. This is called a stent. It's a compressed metal mesh tube that starts, uh, starts in a compressed form and it's um, it, down the middle of it is this green guide wire, and in between the guide wire and the inside of the metal mesh is a cylindrical plastic tube. So they slide this whole thing through the catheter that you saw from my, where it comes out of my leg into the place where the doctor th um, thinks the clog is. And there's these uh, two small beads uh, at the ends that um, show up well in the x-ray so the doctor can help position this. Um, but uh, here I'll show what happens. Um, usually this is only done inside the body, but here's a little clip that shows what how this is inflated. So they uh, put a compressed uh, liquid to inflate this balloon. The metal mesh expands, uh, pushing whatever clog may be there out of the way. The, mesh is designed so that it locks into place. So once it's inflated like this and expanded, it can't um, collapse again. And they quickly then deflate the balloon and pull the balloon and the guide wire out um, while it's uh, inflated. Of course, there's no blood flow through the blood vessel. So here you can see the, the, the beads that are used for positioning. So here's the, where the doctor slid this whole thing from my leg through the catheter into the place where he remembered from that previous video that you saw where the clog was. And he's about to start the inflation process. So here it goes. At the beginning, it, uh, it inflates pretty easily, but then uh, as it goes along, it hits the clog. Mm, that's a little harder to get that open, but eventually it's uh, 
fully inflated, fully expanded stent. And uh, you know, while this is going on, there's no blood flow getting through. So they got to do this very quickly, but then they'll, he will um, deflate the balloon and pull that out. Uh, and this next one, the guide wire is still in place and the stent is still in place. The balloon is gone. You can't see the stent very well. Um, doesn't show up in the x-rays, but it's there and it will be there for the rest of my life. It cannot be removed. Um, and, but now the doctor is about to put some more dye in and have a look at that blood flow. Here we go. Now look at that. Isn't that a whole lot better blood flow than before? When I saw this, I thought this technology saved me. And then I started reading about how horrible and ineffective this process is. And I kind of changed my mind about that, but I'll, I'll share that with you in a few minutes. But uh, this did allow me to um, uh, recover uh, that from that original cardiac arrest. I was only in the hospital for five days. The first uh, day was kind of dicey. I would wake up out of a, my coma and see my wife there and say, honey, what happened? Where am I? She said, you're in the hospital. You had a heart attack. I said, oh, okay. And I drift off. And a few minutes later, I would come to again and I would say, honey, what happened? Where am I? I couldn't, couldn't remember the conversation from five minutes before. And, um, but after a couple of days, I could kind of remember the conversations from five minutes before. And in, in only five days, they sent me home. Yay. Uh, they said, don't go back to work just yet. So I took another week off from work. But after two weeks, went from heart stopped on the street to back to work. I thought that was pretty good. They said, don't go back to running just yet. We need to do some more tests. And um, of the 3% who survive cardiac arrest, like I did, the lucky 3%, most of those people have either residual brain damage or residual heart muscle damage or both. Now, I seem to be okay on the brain side, although when I forget my anniversary, I say, honey, oh, it was the heart attack. It's a great excuse for just getting old and forgetful, but um, seemed to be okay on the brain side, but they needed to do some tests to see if my heart muscle had been permanently damaged as is often the case with cardiac arrest. So they did a perfusion test it involves radioactivity and some special imaging, but the tests came back okay. There wasn't any residual heart muscle damage. So the doctor said, you can go back to your life the way it was, yay. That's the way I took it at first the way he intended, you can, this trauma that affected your, your, you, your coworkers, your family, and so on, you can just kind of forget about that, let it recede into the past. But the more I thought about this phrase, my life the way it was, you know, I thought, well, if my life the way it was included the heart attack, I sure didn't want to go back to that. And I, I started wondering what causes heart disease. It was my life the way it was the cause? Um, I would guess that the vast majority of Americans couldn't say concisely what causes heart disease. In a few minutes, if you haven't figured it out already, you will know exactly what causes heart disease in almost all cases. But um, I didn't know. Uh, I, I really wanted to know what caused it and can it be prevented and reversed? So I never have to go back to this again. And that my investigations into these questions, it really consumed me for the, the last 12 years. I've been reading medical journals, going to medical conferences, talking to experts, and I found some really surprising things that I, I want to share with you. I eventually found my way to this uh, a researcher, Caldwell Esselstyn, who has some very interesting papers published in journals, but he also wrote a book that is very readable for anyone. It's called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And um, I would strongly recommend this book to anyone, but in, in case you don't happen to pick it up and read it, I'll, I'll uh, talk about a couple of key points from that book. He says nearly half the people in the U.S. will suffer heart disease. Wow. Not all of those half will die of it but half will suffer from it. And he says, 
you really should know your cholesterol levels, both your total and your LDL. Those are the key meaningful numbers. And you need to know what healthy numbers are. If your total is below 150 total cholesterol and your LDL is below 80 milligrams per deciliter, you're safe. Not all doctors know that. So you, if there's anything that I would love you to come away from this talk, it's these two numbers, 150 and 80. So if you're naturally in that category and you're not on any medications, but your numbers are below that, you can sign off of this Zoom call now because nothing I can say will help reduce your chances of having a heart attack because you won't have one. But I'm sorry to say the vast majority of Americans are over these numbers, some a little bit, and many people a significant amount over these numbers. This doctor says, if your numbers are higher than this, fix the problem yourself. Doctors cannot fix this problem. This is a doctor saying doctors cannot fix the leading cause of death in this country. These two statements are either scary or great, depending on what kind of a person you are. If you're the kind of person who just wants to live your life however it pleases you at the moment, and if something goes wrong medically, you'll go to the doctor and fi they'll fix it, this is scary because doctors cannot fix the leading killer in this country. But if you're the kind of person who wants to decide for yourself whether you're going to be healthy or sick, you want to decide for yourself through your own actions whether you're going to live a long time or cut it short, this is awesome because it's under your control. If you don't fix the problem yourself, um, the medical establishment has a number of things they would do to you or have you do to yourself. Um, there's a group of medications that are called statin drugs. The trade names uh, for the most popular ones are Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor. There's uh, generic equivalents names, uh, Simvastatin, Atorvastatin. Turns out these medications don't work very well at all and they have harmful side effects. And we'll talk about both of those uh, in more detail in a little bit. The next thing they might wanna do to you is put a stent in like they did to me. Uh, I think this number is a little old. I think the num this number has crept up to over a million a year that they put in in this country and they don't cure heart disease. They're not addressing the root cause. It's a Band-Aid that doesn't work very well. We'll talk more about that shortly. The next thing they might, want to do for you is called coronary artery bypass graft, C-A-B-G, sometimes pronounced cabbage, or just bypass surgery. You may remember President Clinton had bypass surgery. A lot of people you around you may have had bypass surgery. Um, we do half a million of those in this country, and they don't cure heart disease. We spend $10 billion, not million, but billion dollars a year on the statins alone. We spend $50 billion a year on these other interventions that don't cure heart disease. And, and that doesn't take into account the cost of lost work and funerals and things like that, uh, that end up totaling this more than $200 billion uh, in this country on heart disease. But diet can prevent and reverse heart disease. Really? Hmm. Let's look into that a little bit more. Well, I'm convinced that one of the reasons that heart disease is so prevalent is most of us in this country and, and everywhere don't have a good idea in our minds as the, to the relationship between what we choose to put in our mouth to eat and what happens after we eat that stuff, what happens inside our body. After all, how can we know that? Once it goes past the lips and past the teeth, we don't see what goes on. Well, um, here's a couple of little video clips I ran across that um, may help us understand that a little bit. This uh, first one, uh, Dr. Clapper is uh, going to talk about these two blood samples in front of him. They come from two different patients. Uh, after the blood test is the blood sample is taken, they either let it sit in the test tube for quite a while so that it separates out into the different components or they may put it in a centrifuge to hurry up that process a little bit. But they wanna look at the different components that, that are separated out. You may recall that when you 
uh, go for a blood test, uh, the doctor or the nurse says, don't eat anything for 10 or 12 hours before you give this sample. And you may not know why they, they tell you that, but you will know shortly. The person who gave the sample on the left uh, adhered to that guideline. The person who ate the sample on, or who gave the, the sample on the right, uh, not so much. Now, normally, this liquid layer floating on top of the blood clot is quite transparent. It's a yellow, but quite clear. You can see right through it. The blood in this patient's tube, however, was anything but clear. The serum floating on his clot was thick and greasy white. It looked like glue. In fact, it stuck to the sides of the blood tube when I shook the tube. I went back to the patient. I said, Mr. Phillips, did you eat before you came to the hospital tonight? He said, yes. I said, what did you have? He said, I had a cheeseburger and a milkshake. And when he said that, I realized that what I was looking at in his tube was all the fat in the beef burger, all the butter fat in the cheese and the butter fat in the ice cream and in the milkshake. Now, if you've ever once in your life had a cheeseburger and a milkshake, don't worry too much. Your body works hard to cleanse that out. Uh, that, that fatty stuff gets into your, from your stomach into your bloodstream fairly quickly and uh, uh, impairs the function for eight to 10 hours before your body can really clear that away. But what do most Americans do before their body has had a chance to clear that stuff away? They eat some more of the same things. So a lot of Americans are bathing the insides of their arteries with that gluey gunk that you saw 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Even then your body is amazing. It will go for years doing its best to clear this stuff away and you won't even notice it. And it may even go decades before you notice it. For me, it was 52 years before it was, I was <laughs> heart stopped on the street. Um, hard to say exactly how long it will take for you, but um, your body can't clear this away indefinitely. Now, let's take a look at the result. Um, this uh, gentleman, we don't know for sure what his diet is, but we might guess that that wasn't his first milkshake and cheeseburger. So after a lifetime of this stuff, what do the insides of his arteries look like? The next morning, we took Mr. Phillips to the operating room, and I put him to sleep, and the surgeon opened up his chest. And from these arteries, he began pulling out yellow, greasy deposits of fatty material called atherosclerosis. So the next time you're tempted to reach for a cheeseburger or a milkshake, I want you to remember this picture. This is what you're doing to the insides of your arteries. Now, you also need to understand that this roto-rooter job that this guy is getting from the surgeon doesn't fix this problem. The cholesterol deposits that you see there, that yellow string, it actually doesn't build up on the inside wall of the artery. The cholesterol gets past the first layer of cells called the endothelium, the, basically the inner skin of the artery, and builds up just behind that. And so to strip this out, to clear the artery, they're also stripping out the inner lining of this guy's artery, which has about 10 different critical functions to, to uh, provide you. So this, uh, this surgery actually reduces the lifespan, so they don't do this anymore. But I thought it was quite instructive so that, because you can see now the results of eating those cheeseburgers and milkshakes. I want to talk for a little bit about cholesterol blood tests. Uh, the cholesterol in your blood, it, uh, some of that is natural. Your liver produces cholesterol in generally about the right amounts that your body needs and the right types. Wherever your body is producing new cell walls, which is you know, sort of a continuous process throughout your body, it needs the cholesterol to build up those cell walls. So some of it is in your bloodstream naturally. Uh, your liver produces it and the blood takes it around to wherever it's needed. The other source of cholesterol in your bloodstream are the animal products you eat. No plant products whatsoever have cholesterol in them. Most, uh, many uh, animal products do. Um, the, when they take the, a measurement of your blood, they're measuring the sum of the cholesterol that's in your blood that's supposed to be there and the cholesterol that would really be much better if it weren't there based on the animal products you ate. 
even then it's not like the cholesterol builds up and when it hits a certain point you have a heart attack no it's the elevated level of cholesterol over a long period of time that does the damage and uh, but it turns out that um, the cholesterol doesn't change all that quickly and so that if you um, um, have a high cholesterol blood test today that probably means that last week and last month and last year you also had high cholesterol if you continuing to eat the same way. So, and they have found that um, when you take this measurement, it's a good indicator of your likelihood of death. The, the Framingham Heart Study established this correlation. They took, uh, uh, Framingham is a small city outside of Boston, and for decades they would take people's blood tests and see how much cholesterol they had, and then they track them to see who died of heart disease. And they found, sure enough, the people with the high cholesterol in their blood died more of heart attacks. So it was a good um, marker. Uh, it's good. It's an effective diagnostic tool. That is, go ahead, get that blood test from your doctor, and then compare it to the numbers that we mentioned before. And that will tell you whether you're really never going to have a heart attack, or you're at risk a little bit, or you're at risk a lot. Now, I'm a patient of Kaiser Permanente, a health maintenance organization out here in California. Um, and when I get my blood test from results back from them, they give me my number for my blood and a standard number uh, to compare against. And they give a standard number of 200. Now, as we mentioned before, the research shows that for you to be healthy, it needs to be below 150, not 200. So I asked Kaiser, where did you get that 200 number? And they said, well, we get it from the American Heart Association. That's a, a guideline that they give us. And I contacted the American Heart Association and said, where do you get that 200 number? And they said, well, that's a, a, approximately the average of all Americans. Hmm. This is an average among a group of people whose leading cause of death is heart disease. Believe me, you don't want to be average. You want to be healthy. So uh, don't believe that 200 is okay. In fact, the Framingham Heart Study, the very one that established the validity of these measurements, they found that a third of the people with heart disease had cholesterol between 150 and 200. So by all means, it's better to be below 200 than above. You'd rather be in the one third of the heart disease than two thirds. But don't believe that you're okay just because you're a little bit under 200. In fact, I'm a great example of that. My last blood test before my cardiac arrest, I was at 188. So if you're comparing that against 200, you'd say, I'm healthy. I disagree. I almost died. So let's talk now about what statin drugs do to this cholesterol blood test. They really do um, lower the cholesterol blood test, but it breaks the correlation. That is, the cholesterol blood test goes down making, if, if you take these drugs, making you think you're healthier, but you still die nearly as often. Let me draw an analogy. If you're driving your car and the red check engine light comes on, you know that the red light flowing into the passenger compartment of your car isn't the problem. The problem is deep down hidden inside your engine, um, and this red light is just an indicator that there's a problem somewhere else. But you know that this is serious, and so you don't uh, ignore that. You take your car into the mechanic, and the next day the car comes back and the check engine light is off. And you think, yay, the mechanic fixed the problem. Now, if you happen to look under the dashboard and you located the wiring going to the red light, and you saw this, you might uh, conclude that, in fact, the mechanic didn't fix the problem. He just disabled the indicator and charged you a bunch of money making you think your car was okay. And you would be, I think, rightfully really angry at that mechanic. Well, that's what's happening with statin drugs. Do not let them fool you into thinking you're healthy just because your cholesterol blood test goes down. Now, what are these drugs doing if they're not really helping you very much? It turns out that statin drugs are chemicals specifically chosen for their property to 
interfere with the liver's natural production of cholesterol. Let me put this a different way. These are liver toxins. These are liver poisons that your doctor has convinced you that you should take to mess up the functioning of your liver in order to artificially drive down this blood test. And they, they do work. Your liver produces less of the cholesterol that's supposed to be there. These drugs don't do anything about the cholesterol in your bloodstream from the cheeseburgers and milkshakes and stuff that you ate. So, you know, when you think of it that way, maybe it's not so surprising that uh, the death rate doesn't go down very much. And there's these side effects, the biggest ones being liver damage. Now, when I was taking these drugs sh shortly after my cardiac arrest and hadn't done enough research to know better, um, I, I found on the fine print of the, the statin drugs uh, words that said something like, you know, if you take these drugs for any length of time, you should take a standard liver test. And if that shows your liver's having problems, you should discontinue the use of this medication. Well, if you look at the fine print of your statin drugs today, you won't find that. And the reason is they found that the standard liver test that was designed for determining liver damage from alcoholism, you know, that doesn't, really, that doesn't show the liver damage due to your, your, the statin drugs. So there is no real benefit from taking the, the liver test. That doesn't mean the liver isn't being damaged, just you can't pick up the liver damage by the standard liver test. The, another um, major side effect of statin drugs is muscle problems. This tends to be fairly uh, variable from person to person. Some people can have, take a pretty large dose of statin drugs and have only mild muscle soreness. Others can, uh, with even a small bit of the drug, have quite a lot of muscle soreness. Then the other big side effect of statin drugs is brain damage, but let me describe in, in some detail what I mean by damage. There's a set of symptoms that look a lot like Alzheimer's. It includes concentration loss, cognition problems, short-term memory. Um, those of you who know a little bit about Alzheimer's know that it is a progressive disease. There's no treatment known today that reverses Alzheimer's. There's some drugs that are trying to stop its being progression, but there's none that really uh, reverse it. And you may also be aware that Alzheimer's can only be conclusively diagnosed on death. They do an autopsy, cut open the, the skull and look at the brain tissue and they can tell, oh yes, this person has Alzheimer's or no, this person doesn't. But before a person dies, if they're exhibiting these mental problems, cognition and memory issues, uh, concentration problems, they, they may uh, tentatively diagnose that they have Alzheimer's. But they're finding more and more that these people that are, have a tentative di Alzheimer's diagnosis, if they're on statin drugs, and then they take them off the statin drugs, they get better. Not, not completely, not right away, but um, then that disease can't be Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of people being misdiagnosed as having Alzheimer's when it's really the drugs that their doctors have convinced them to take. And I bet everyone listening here today is, is really intelligent and has lots of brain cells to spare, but I don't, I need all of mine working. I need everyone. So this is to me was the scariest aspect of taking these drugs and I no longer take them. As I uh, read the medical journals, I would run across these really fascinating um, uh, articles, research, research results, that each one individually was interesting to me, but eventually I realized that I could put them all on this one bar chart and, and compare them. And the way I do that is each of these research papers has two groups, the untreated group and the one that's getting a particular treatment. And so I've normalized to the control group, if you will. I've made the untreated group, I've uh, scaled that to be this 100% red bar here. And then we're gonna look at five different studies and see how they compare to the untreated group. The first study comes from Duke University where for years uh, they would take patients coming into their medical center as candidates for stents, these metal mesh tubes like the, the you saw that I got. And they would, uh, arbitrarily choose to give half of them stents and half of them wouldn't get the stents. 
and they would track both groups of patients to see how many of them died and, and how many of them didn't. And so they, they eventually got enough data that they published this in a medical journal. I picked two numbers out of there. What is the death rate per patient for the group who were untreated? And I scaled that to 100%. So this red bar that you see, I applied the same visual scaling to the death rate for the group who got the stents. Now, if you um, thought stents were going to be very uh, effective, you would expect this red bar to be much lower than this one. Here it is. 90% of the people who would die without a stent still die. It barely registers in terms of effectiveness. Wow. Interesting. Okay, the next study I ran into was these statin drugs like Lipitor. How effective are they at reducing the cholesterol blood test? Very. Ladies and gentlemen, statin drugs work. They work to lower the blood test measurement. Do we care about the blood test measurement? only to the extent that it's an indicator of our chances of dying of heart disease. That's what that test is all about. Well, instead of looking at the test, let's look at the actual death rate. So this next red bar I'm gonna show is from this uh, June 2010 study I mentioned before, where they took 65,000 people who all had elevated cholesterol, they had heart issues. They left half of them untreated and um, I took the death rate for that group and scaled it to 100%. I applied the same scaling to the death rate for the group who got the statin drugs, and there it is. 91% of the people who would die without the statin drugs still die. Now, I can't claim that there's no benefit, although the author of the study said exactly that. He said, within the error bounds of this study, we cannot conclude any benefit of statin drugs. But let me just say, mathematically, the most likely from this study suggests that 9% of the lives would be saved. Well, that's a lot different than this. By the way, this is the cutting of the cable to the red light. This is the difference between the indicator making you think you're healthy and what, what's really going on inside of you, which is not very healthy. What really bothers me about this, though, is... Um, the, the doctors present this as though it is the solution. They don't tell you how really rotten it is in terms of its effectiveness. They don't tell you about the side effects, including cognition problems. And uh, most of them aren't gonna tell you about these other alternatives, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, so let's talk about the first one. This next study came from the UK where they asked people over a long period of time, what do you eat? And um, in, in England, they eat pretty much the way we do here, uh, a lot of uh, meat and dairy and eggs and so on. Um, and like here, uh, some small percentage of them just choose to not eat meat. So that would be a vegetarian. A vegetarian may, it would still be a vegetarian while eating dairy products and, um, and eggs, but just no meat. So they asked, these people uh, categorize them vegetarian or not. They track their death rate due to heart disease over a long period of time. I took the death rate for the group that ate pretty much the way we, most Americans eat, including uh, plenty of meat. And uh, that's the baseline death rate. Uh, the group that just chose to eliminate meat from their diet, there's their death rate. Hmm, still a lot of red here. And you could look at that and say, well, that's not that different than the drug. Well, don't look at the height of the red bar, but look at the white gap above it. This is the lives saved. This course of action is three times more effective than this one at reducing the death rate. If the pharmaceutical companies had a drug that was three times better than statins, they would make billions of dollars, but they don't have such a drug. This is the best that they can do but you can do three times better just by cutting meat out of your diet. Interesting. But wait, there's one more study I need to share with you. Uh, this uh, was originally uh, done by Caldwell Esselstyn, and it was in his book, uh, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, that I mentioned earlier. And that preliminary study involved 18 patients, and I found the results fascinating. 
I think you would too if you read that book. But he was uh, criticized for making generalizations that uh, this thing that applied to 18 people would uh, apply to a larger group. So he got together with some other researchers, they raised some money and they did another study that involved 200 patients. They took each of the patients, and these are all people at high risk of heart disease, high cholesterol, maybe they've already had some sort of heart event. Uh, they, they brought them into the doctor's office one at a time. And the doctor said, I really want you to eat this particular diet. And I'll, I'll go into detail in just a moment as to what it is, but for now we'll just call it the ideal diet. I want you to eat this ideal diet because I think it's gonna have a big impact on your heart disease. 90% of the patients said, yep, doc, I'm in. I'm really gonna do this thing. The other 10% said, hmm, no, you're asking me to give up some foods that I really love. I'm just not willing to do it. Doctor said, that's fine, stay in the study. And now we have our control group, our, our untreated group, the ones who are the baseline that uh, continue the way they had before and the ones that adopt the ideal diet. Now for this study, they looked at not just deaths due to heart disease, but four other cardiac events as well. The heart attack didn't result in death, uh, angina, the chest pain, uh, stent emplacements or bypass surgeries. So they tallied up these five types of cardiac events. And in a, a paper that's uh, published in a, a journal, medical journal, I picked out from there two numbers. One is the average cardiac event rate per patient for the group that continued to eat the way they always had, scaled that to 100%. I applied the same scaling to the cardiac event rate for the group who adopted an ideal diet. And I'm about to show you the height of that red bar, but before I do, I want each of you to think to yourself, how low does that red bar need to go before it's important to you? I think you'd all agree that it has to go below this level. You know, if it turns out this red bar is up here, well, we won't do that. We'll do the vegetarian thing. So it needs to go below that, but how far down does it need to go before it's really important to you? Ready to see the height of that red bar? Here it is, 1%. Wow, 99% of this country's leading killer just goes away if you eat the right things and avoid eating the wrong things. Wow, is anybody else astonished by that? I just found this incredible. There's some consequences to this study. What this study says is if you eat properly, you don't have heart disease. The converse of that is if you have heart disease, you're not eating properly, which means if you have heart disease, it's your fault. This is the study that forced me to conclude that that blockage that you saw in my coronary artery earlier on was my fault. I did this to myself by choosing to eat the wrong things. Now, I didn't know at the time what the ideal diet was, and I didn't know the results of this study, but um, now we all do. Here's uh, some pictures from Esselstyn's book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. Here's a gentleman who had a problem with his left anterior descending coronary artery. Uh, this is the same coronary artery that I had that was clogged. Uh, it's often called the widow maker for obvious reasons. This guy, you can see, had not just one clogged spot, but he had this whole length uh, that was clogged, and they couldn't stent that. And so the only choice he had was to go down the hall to this other doctor who had this weird idea about diet. And so, but he adopted that diet. And uh, because this patient was actually a doctor himself, they had, were able to have a look at him uh, two and a half years later when he wasn't having any problems, but they, they had a look anyway. Look at the same coronary artery as before. It has healed itself. Your body has an amazing ability to heal if you quit abusing it three times a day with the stuff that you're eating. And this is not new information either. We've known this for... Uh, couple of decades now. So what is this ideal diet? Let's start with the things that are killing us. Red meat, you knew that. I don't have to tell you that. It's been 
talked about for many, many years in the press about how bad red meat is. You knew that. What you may not be aware of is that pork, chicken, and fish are equally bad. And fish has a special problem I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit. What is bad about these? Animal protein is quite harmful to us. It's very inflammatory, roughs up the insides of our artery walls. And these things also have animal fat in them, cholesterol. And once those artery walls are roughed up, that cholesterol gets in behind and starts to clog. The animal protein is bad for us. The animal fat is bad for us. Together, they're the perfect storm that just ravage our bodies top to bottom. What's probably even worse than meats, many of the researchers think, are dairy products. We're talking about milk, butter, ice cream, cheese. Some researchers call cheese the most damaging substance on the planet. Eggs, why? Because they have animal protein and animal fat. Processed foods, and I put a placeholder here as a donut, but there's a whole lot of things that are heavily processed. And here's just a few of them. You can probably guess that these are unhealthy. We're talking about candy, cake, cookies, donuts, pastries, sugary cereals, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and I, but I just categorize those as processed foods and, and there's the placeholder. And here's another one that's harmful to us, vegetable oil. And um, we often, this is used in frying food, but oil, it turns out, gets into a lot of other things. Uh, it's hard to find any kind of a chip or a cracker that isn't heavily laden with oil. Many of the salad dressings have oil in them. Of course, these fake butters and things, products that we think of as healthy, like granola bars, take a look. The amount of oil in there is uh, generally pretty significant and therefore the high fat content. Now, I'm not saying that you should never eat any of these things, but I'm saying if you choose to eat these things on a regular basis, the science is very, very clear. The most likely scenario for you is heart disease and you in a casket before your time, your choice. Or you could choose to eat these foods instead. A variety of healthy, colorful vegetables, emphasis on leafy greens, fruits in moderation, beans are awesome, whole grains, including corn, oatmeal, brown rice. White rice is okay, brown is better whole wheat, not that processed white stuff, but whole wheat. Potatoes are nutritionally excellent. The problem with potatoes in our society is the company they keep. You take a healthy potato, you slice it and cook it in oil, it becomes unhealthy. You take a totally healthy baked potato and you slather on some butter, some sour cream, some cheese, you've just made it unhealthy. But the potato itself is excellent. What's even more uh, nutritionally complete and totally awesome are sweet potatoes. There are some societies in this planet that eat nothing but sweet potatoes. They don't have heart disease. They don't have colon cancer. Um, I'm not saying that you should eat only these foods, but I'm saying if you should choose to only eat these foods, the science is really, really clear as to what will happen. You're going to live somewhere between 14 to 20 more years depending on what study and exactly how they run that study. That means perhaps not only just seeing your kids grow up, but your grandkids. Awesome. And in your old age, the closest thing you'll come to the graveyard is when you go running through and you see the gravestones of the people who ate the things in the previous slide. Now, what may be more important to you than your, those extra years is the quality of those years. In this country, the average number of years of disability before death is about nine. And our medical system is very good at keeping people alive after life sucks. You've had a heart attack that hasn't killed you. You had a stroke, you have arthritis. You can either eat properly and get rid of those things that cause your, uh, you to be, your life quality to suffer. That is, you can have nine really terrible years and then die, or through your food choice, you can have nine really great, productive, healthy years, followed by 14 to 20 more healthy, productive years. Your choice based on what you choose to eat. 
The researchers in this field call this a low fat whole plant diet. Now you probably have heard the word vegan, it's becoming more and more popular. Vegetarian means just no meat, but you might eat dairy and eggs. Vegan means no animal products at all. So no meat, no dairy, no eggs. Um, but there's a lot of unhealthy vegan foods, heavily processed fake meats and so on. So the researchers generally don't use the word vegan. Uh, it's useful in a restaurant setting perhaps, but um, the, the researchers call us a low fat, whole food, plant-based diet. This is the, the ideal diet from the, the study. What does this consist of? Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and legumes. This is just in text form what you saw in pictures in the previous slides for those who like words better than pictures. No meat or fish, no eggs or dairy products, no oils, including olive oil, no processed foods like the donuts and candies and so on. That's where the whole comes in, in the, the whole plant diet. We're not just you know, breaking down the plant and taking some component of it only, we're, we're eating the whole thing. And then where the low fat part comes in is you really want less than 10% of your total calories to be from fat. You may be aware that calories come from only three groups, um, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Um, it, you, but you really want to have less than 10% of your total calories from fat. Standard American diet is 35%. So, uh, some of the experts suggest that maybe 7% is about ideal. So most Americans, average Americans are, are consuming more than five times the percentage of fat calories that they should. And uh, some researchers have done experiments with a low fat diet of only 30% fat, and it doesn't help very much. Duh, you really need to get down to 10% or less of your calories from fat. Now, how are you gonna do that? Are you gonna keep track of all your calories of all kinds, and especially your calories from fat and throughout the day, you know, make sure that toward the end of the day, you, you know, change your behavior if you're ahead of your 10%. Your There's no need to do that. So you're getting rid of the meat, the fish, eggs, and oils. That's where most of the fat in our diet comes from. So you're a long ways there. And, and these processed foods as well often have a lot of fat in them. So just getting rid of these things gets you a long ways toward um, getting your fat calories under this uh, desired 10%. But there's a small number of whole plant foods that are just too fat for to be healthy for us. And that includes nuts, coconut, and avocados, nuts and seeds. So you'll notice that this guideline is gray instead of black. It's not quite a strong guideline, but it's still important. And there's a big asterisk there. That is, if you are totally healthy by a lot of metrics, you can safely, healthily have a little bit of nuts, coconut, and avocado. That means if you your body mass index suggests that you computes that you are in the normal weight range, you're not overweight or obese. If your blood pressure is below 120 over 80 with no medications, your cholesterol is under 150 and your LDL is below 80 with no medications, your blood sugar is below 100 with no medications, and you've never been diagnosed with cancer or heart disease. If all of those things apply to you, you can safely have a little bit of nuts, coconut, and avocado. A little bit of nuts means have some slivered almonds on your green salad. It doesn't mean opening a 16 ounce jar of planters peanuts and eating it in front of the big game all at once. That's not healthy for anyone. If you're totally healthy, you can have a little bit of coconut in your entree or your dessert. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to avoid that nasty ice cream and instead I'll have a non-dairy frozen dessert that is made up almost entirely of coconut oil, which is 95% saturated fat. That's not okay for anyone. If you're totally healthy, you can have a little bit of avocados, uh, have a few slices on your green salad. It doesn't mean oh, I'm gonna eat a, make a quart of guacamole and eat it all at once. That's not healthy for anyone. And you also should be cautious with soy products and fruit juice. 
Soy is very healthy um, if it's in its whole form, uh, but a lot of the fake meats are they are made from co single components of soybeans. They they break it down chemically. They take out the fat and the carbohydrates, leaving you with isolated soy protein, which they then extrude into all kinds of things that seem like meat. Um, they're better than meat because they don't have any cholesterol in them, but they're not very healthy. Um, and fruit juice is a high sugar concentrate. So if you think you're doing yourself and your family a favor by getting rid of the 42 ounce big gulp uh, soda and replacing it with 42 ounces of fruit juice, it's not a whole lot better. So uh, have a little bit of fruit juice in your cooking, but don't, uh, don't drink a lot of that. Here's what Esselstyn, the author of this book says about this diet. He says, some people think a whole food plant-based diet is extreme. I mean, after all, we've been raised to believe that we should eat meat and, and drink milk. And, and have, cutting that out completely, many people would say is extreme. Esselstyn goes on to say, half a million people a year will have their chests opened up and a vein taken from their leg and sewn onto their coronary artery. Some people would call that extreme. That's this bypass surgery. So when you think about being on the operating table with this buzz saw going through your chest bone, cutting it open so they can get at the heart and do this surgery thing, maybe you would say, you know, having less beef and more broccoli, maybe that isn't so extreme after all. Here's a, a patient in the hospital who says, so now what, doctor? And the doctor says, coronary bypass, don't worry. It's one of the most common surgeries in the world today. Uh, any alternatives as a patient? Yes, but it's considered too radical by modern medicine. Go on a plant-based diet. And by hospital regulations, I must advise against it. Really? Why? $200,000 per surgery, zilch for the diet, do the math. So <laughs> this is both funny and sad at the same time little bit of truth in there. I want to talk for a few minutes about cancer. I wasn't originally interested in that because I had heart disease, but the more I ran into uh, research articles that uh, talked about the relationship of food and disease, I ran into these articles that had uh, relayed, related our food choices to cancer. So I started learning a little bit more about that. Cancer is the second biggest killer in the US, uh, right behind heart disease. Some people think it will overtake it, we'll see. Um, sorry to tell you that most of us probably have cancer cells in us right now. Um, the researchers suggest that an average American adult produces about one new cancerous cell every day. So if you were cancer free yesterday, you probably have one cancer cell today. This, uh, you have, trillions of cells in your body. They're continuously replicating. They have a super, super low error rate, but with so many replications happening, uh, even a small error rate results in some cells that are created that don't have the limits on their uh, dividing and, and growing. And those are, are cancerous cells. So they happen in all of us, but our body has defense mechanisms. And in most cases, these mechanisms prevent these cancerous cells from growing in beyond without bound. But occasionally one of those cells evades the defense mechanisms and grows for 10, 20, 30 years or more. Um, most of that time you don't know it's there, only at the end uh, is it big enough to detect. And then um, maybe a short time after that, uh, it might kill somebody. We, we think of cancer as, often fast growing. You may have heard of people or know, had good friends that um, they were diagnosed with cancer and six months later, they're dead. And you think, wow, that cancer just came out of nowhere and in six months killed them. No, it was growing for 10, 20, 30 years undetected. And then it got big enough to detect. And then a short period of time after that, it was even bigger and killed them. Uh, it, with a consistent diet, the doubling rate usually remains constant but you can affect that doubling rate. Changing the diet can change the growth rate and often reverse it. It's not quite as dramatic uh, numerically as it was with the, the red bar charts with um, 
the heart disease. And it depends dramatically on which cancer you're talking about and how long it's been growing uh, undetected. But we hear stories of people who are told by their doctors, you know, this cancer is beyond anything we can do, uh, just go home and prepare to die. And they go home and they change their diet and the cancer goes away. Uh, doesn't happen all the time, but it, it happens fairly often. This is awesome if you can make the tumor shrink through your diet. But even if you can't make it shrink, if you can just bring it to a halt so it doesn't grow anymore, that is usually okay if the tumor hasn't killed you yet. Um, maybe you can continue to live with it the same size. If you can't bring the growth rate to zero, but you can slow it down, that can also be enough. Uh, most men in this country at the time of death have prostate cancer, but most men don't die of prostate cancer because for most of us, it's a slow growing cancer. We outlive it and we die of other things. So if you can just slow down that cancer growth enough to um, outlive it, uh, that can be enough. But it's really, really important to make that change early on in the cancer growth. 10, 20, 30 years before you even know you have the cancer, you want to be slowing it down. So in that case, way, it's very similar to a heart attack. Heart attack, you often don't know you have it, heart disease until you have cardiac arrest and it's too late. Cancer, often you don't know you have cancer until it's too late. So make the change to your diet and get that cancer slowing down uh, before you're even aware of it. If you do that, many, but not all lives can be saved. Here are some ideas uh, or some data that uh, give you a, an indicator as to um, the, what foods uh, result in cancer or are correlated with cancer. Here you can say, see a correlation between animal fat intake and breast cancer. Animal fat intake for each of these countries is plotted horizontally. The cancer rate is vertically. You can see the countries that have more animal fat intake have more can breast cancer. Here's another one that just looks at total meat consumption. Um, and again, you can see the ones with more meat have more, in this case, colon cancer. The leading theory now is it's really more the animal protein that causes the cancer. Um, but the truth is when you eat meat, you get protein and fat. You can't really easily separate those. So um, you know, if you're eating animal products, you're increasing your cancer rate. Here's a, some experiments that were done decades ago to try to figure out um, the relationship between diet and cancer. This was reported on in a book called The China Study by Colin Campbell, uh, but he was reporting on research that was done in India, again, many decades ago, and he found this very interesting. Um, the, the researchers took a group of lab animals and they uh, gave them aflatoxin, which comes from moldy peanuts and induces liver cancer. So by all means, don't eat moldy peanuts. Uh, half of the injected um, cancer-induced rats, they gave a standard mouse, standard rat diet, uh, and they added 5% milk protein. And they found that 100% of these animals lived their normal life their coats were normal, their behavior was normal. They were able to fight off this induced cancer. The other half of the lab animals, lab rats, were given the exact same diet, except they boosted up the milk protein to 20%. And 100% of those animals died. Wow. Just boosting up this casein, this milk protein, a little bit made this dramatic difference. Now this researcher from um, the United States uh, saw this study and he thought, this is really interesting. And so they tried uh, repeating this experiment in their own lab and they found the same results. And he wanted to go further. He wanted to understand when in the evolution of this cancer is the milk protein important? So is it at the beginning or the end, the middle? So he did a slightly different experiment. This time, instead of keeping his test rats on the same diet throughout the study, he kept them in one group and switched their diets back and forth between 5 and 20% dairy protein, doing so at three-week intervals. The results were astonishing. 
Whenever the rats were fed 20% protein, early liver tumor growth exploded. But when the same rats were given 5% protein, tumor growth actually went down. Wow. So he found that the, it really didn't matter where in the life cycle the cancer was. Giving more dairy protein fueled the cancer, like gas on the fire. This led him to say this. Casein, the main protein of cow's milk, is the most relevant chemical carcinogen ever identified. Hmm. Think about this the next time you're reaching for that milk or cheese. You're consuming the most relevant chemical carcinogen ever identified. I'm going to talk briefly about diabetes. There's two different diseases that have the same name, type 1 diabetes and type 2 um, Type 1 diabetes has a strong correlation with cow's milk consumption, as you can see in this chart. Um, and the, the uh, theory there is that uh, type, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. And the, the milk protein, especially consumed by children, um, some of it works its way through the intestinal walls into the bloodstream where the immune system detects this foreign protein and produces an antibody to attack it. Now that's fine because you don't want milk protein in your blood. The problem is the milk protein is very similar to the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. And so your own immune system ends up attacking your own pancreas, making it so it's not able to produce the insulin that your body needs and then you have type one diabetes. A change in diet to avoid animal products. For most people with type 1 diabetes, it's too late. Um, some people, it makes some improvement, but, uh, but not, not a full cure. Type 2 diabetes is different. It's not caused by eating carbohydrates, as many people think. It's caused by eating fat. And the fat in the muscle cell interferes with their ability to take in the blood sugar. It's not a problem with not getting enough insulin. It's that the insulin can't do its job because the fat, the muscle, the cells are all gummed up by the fat that you ate. And it's often a progressive disease. It results in amputations, blindness, and a painful death. Here's a guy whose foot was suffering from diabetic gangrene. You can see the heel of his foot there. Shortly after this picture was taken, they had to amputate this foot. So it generally progresses and gets worse. You can go with a diet that's uh, uh, recommended by the American Diabetes Association. You would think that that would be the best diet. It, um, it helps a little bit, but generally not enough. If you switch to an ideal diet, studies show that it's three times better in, ter in terms of reducing hemoglobin A A1C, which is an indicator of diabetes. And this three times better is usually sufficient to result in a cure within two to four weeks. This is a disease that gets worse over time, resulting in amputations, blindness, and death that can be usually re reversed in two to four weeks with a dietary change. Wow. Here's a doctor from Northern California who has been curing people of diabetes and heart disease for 30 years or so. He says, this is Dean Ornish, think about it. Heart disease and diabetes are completely preventable by making comprehensive lifestyle changes without drugs or surgery. So hypertension is another word for high blood pressure. It has uh, uh, pretty much the same causes as cor coronary artery disease. It's caused by the restrictions in your arteries, caused by food. Um, but in this case, the symptoms are a little bit different. Your heart responds by pumping harder. It's trying to get the same volume of blood through that restricted artery. It has to pump harder, but it has to pump hard all the time. It's like running a marathon 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and your heart uh, wears out quicker. Medication lowers the blood pressure, but that doesn't solve the root problem, which is the arteries are restricted but diet solves it. And there's several different components of the cure that comes from diet. One of them happens quite quickly. And so you need to be a little cautious of that. If you're on medication that lowers your blood pressure and you switch to this diet that gets rid of the problem 
it can get rid of it within a few days in many cases. And if, so if you continue taking your blood pressure medication, that can drive your blood pressure too low. That can make you pass out. If you're driving your car at the time, that can be fatal. So by all means, do fix your blood pressure problem by switching to this diet, but be ready to taper off your meds within a few days, either checking your blood pressure at home or going to the doctor several times a week to as you're, um, once you have phased in this, this diet. The Center for Disease Control publishes their statistics on the top 15 causes of death. I took these numbers from a few years ago and put them into this pie chart, sort, sorted not just by size, a percentage of, of deaths, but uh, sorted by which ones are affected by our food choices and which ones are not. Heart disease is the leading cause of death right behind it is cancer. We know that almost all heart disease deaths would go away if we ate properly. Most, but not all the cancer deaths would go away. Stroke deaths, diabetes deaths, di blood pressure deaths would go away. Sorry to say that even on the best diet, accidents, suicides, and murders can happen, as will some infections. You know, in these COVID years, uh, these bars would be much greater, not as great as these yet, but, but greater. If you add up all the causes of death that are due to our food choices and those that aren't, you get this. Two thirds of the deaths in this country are due to our unhealthy food choices. Now it'd be very dramatic if I could say to each of you, if you don't get on this ideal diet, you will die as a result of those choices. But I can't say that because a third of the people um, would, would die of other things. So. Um, but still, I think two thirds is a big number. This corresponds to 1.3 million Americans every year. You know, we're in our what second, third year of COVID, and we're just about at the million mark. This is 1.3 million Americans every single year die needlessly because of their food choices. Think of this another way: consider yourself and the two other people you love the most. If the three of you insist on eating the standard American diet, statistically, two out of three of you are going to go to your graves unnecessarily. Please don't. The right diet can prevent, reduce, or reverse heart disease, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, a whole bunch of things. Every time I go to a medical conference, I come back with a couple of more diseases that just go away if you eat this ideal diet. It is amazing and it's great news for us. It's the same diet. If we had to choose between an anti-heart disease diet and an anti-cancer diet that were different, that would be a tough choice. But this one diet gets rid of almost all of that and many of these other things as well. Great. Now, when you uh, talk to somebody tomorrow and you tell them you're gonna go on this plant-based diet, one of the things you'll hear is, oh, but how are you gonna get your protein without meat and dairy? We've been so brainwashed into thinking that those things are important. Well, how much protein do you need? Uh, it's best uh, described as a percentage of your total calories because people who are bigger need more protein, but they also need more calories. If you're more active, you need more protein, but you also need more calories. So the best thing that's sort of independent of your size and activity level is a percentage of calories of protein in your diet. The studies show that we need somewhere between 2.7 and 4% as adults. As a, a baby, we need a little bit more, 5%. But as adults, somewhere in this gray band. Well, what foods can we eat that um, give us that much protein? Apples are a little short, uh, they're 2%. But bananas, oranges, and strawberries are fine. If you ate only, only those things, you'd have plenty of protein. You know, we don't normally think of fruits as protein sources, and they don't have a lot, but we don't need a lot. If you wanna look at some uh, foods that we generally think of as starches, um, baked potatoes, corn, brown rice, they come in at, uh, what's that, seven, eight percent, oatmeal is 12, wheat and quinoa out here at 15%. What does this mean? It means if you go to into a restaurant and you order a baked potato, they're gonna say, and what, protein would you like with that? And they are gonna expect you to say, um, you know, beef, chicken, pork, fish, or maybe that weird tofu stuff. 
But you can say, hey, that baked potato has way more protein than I need. I don't need to add something specifically to have enough protein. Or that side of brown rice that I ordered, it has way more protein than I need. Thank you very much. I don't need to go to extra links for that. If we look at some other foods, uh, carrots are not super, but they're well beyond the minimum. Broccoli and spinach, I had to shrink this whole thing to fit these on, see what a great percentage of protein they are. But when you your friends ask, what, how are you going to get enough protein on a plant-based diet, they probably think you're going to say peas, beans, and lentils, and they don't disappoint us all coming in here between 20 and 30 percent of the calories is protein. And But you don't need these. Again, it's almost any food will do, any whole plant food will do. You don't need to go out of your, in fact, it's very difficult to construct a whole food plant-based diet that is deficient in protein. Just not a problem. In addition to a little bit of protein, a little bit of fat, lots of carbohydrates, uh, our bodies need these non-caloric inputs, building blocks, minerals and micronutrients. These minerals, these metals, um, vitamins, essential fatty acids, and amino acids. We all need to get these from outside our body. Um, plant foods provide all of these things, except for two. Vitamin B12 comes from uh, bacteria and, and vitamin D. You get a little bit in mushrooms maybe, but um, primarily our bodies can produce this in the presence of sunlight. So um, it's highly recommended that you not supplement with these things because that puts the whole balance out of whack. You just get the combination of these things uh, from plant foods. You might want to supplement a little bit of B12 and you should definitely get a few minutes of sunlight um, every day or several times a week to get enough vitamin D. There's nothing that you need animal products for. There's no nutrients that you only get from animal products. I want to talk briefly about biomagnification. This is uh, the process by which toxins get magnified as they go up the food chain. Consider a little piece of pasture land, and there's a tiny bit of uh, toxin in there, this little black dot. If you can't see it, it's right there. And um, maybe it's natural. There are natural toxins around, but primary, pro most likely it's man-made toxin. It's somewhere in that grass. And along comes the cow, and it eats that. And the next day it eats some more grass and gets another little bit of toxin. And one of the things that makes the toxin toxic is our body's inability to get rid of it. And so over the lifetime of the cow, it builds up. So by the time it gets to you in the form of beef or dairy, the toxin that was this little bit here has uh, grown in uh, concentration by a factor of 100 to 1,000. And I've picked maybe about 300 dots here. So it could be three times worse or three times less. What may have been so small that the cow could ignore it, didn't really affect its life very much, may not be at a level that you can ignore it when it's this much more because it's been concentrated in these tissues. Now, it gets even worse in the ocean. There's some toxins in there. There it is. And it's uh, taken up by the green plants in the ocean. And then along comes a krill or a little tiny fish and it eats that green plant. And it does it, these animals do it their whole life. So by the time they're mature, the toxin has grown in concentration by 100 to 1,000 times. And then along comes the tuna or the salmon, and they eat the little fish or the krill. And, and they're, so they're building up uh, toxins in their body that are 100 to 1,000 times that that's in their diet, which is already 100 to 1,000 times what's in the ocean. So by the time it gets to your plate in the form of fish that you eat, it's 100,000, let's see, sorry, 10,000 to a million times the level of toxins that are in the water. If I tried to show you all those dots, I couldn't fit them on the screen, all these toxic, toxic dots. I have to shrink it like this so that you can see it. That's mid-range. The higher end of the range is another factor of 10 beyond that. I have to shrink it like that. And then I uh, found, um, this article about uh, some testing that they'd done on salmon. And they found that the uh, toxin level for some tox toxins was not a million times the level in the water, but 9 million times the level in the water in the salmon they were testing. 
So to show you all the to toxins, I'd have to shrink things like this. So the question is not, will you get some toxins in your fish? The question is, will you get a tiny little bit of fish with all the toxins you're getting? But it can get even worse than that. There's a, 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 a article I read that said a third of the fish caught worldwide is not consumed by humans. It's used as animal feed. So they're taking this stuff that has high levels of toxin and they're feeding it to the cows, pigs, and chickens, which is increasing the toxin level even more. And then you're eating them. Wow. How do you avoid all these toxins? Just don't eat any animal products. So we're getting close to the end here. So stay with me, please. Um, here's some steps to long life and health. Uh, this is John's prescription, if you will. Learn all you can. The fact that you're listening to this is awesome, but uh, since this topic is re responsible for killing two thirds of Americans, it's worth spending a little bit more time on it. Um, you might wanna try one of those books or multiple of books that I mentioned before. You need to be smarter than your doctor. Uh, sadly, most doctors get out of medical school. It's the statistics suggest that 75% of medical schools offer no significant classes in nutrition to their doctors. So the doctors don't necessarily know this much of anything about this topic that kills two thirds of their patients. So you need to be smarter than your doctor. Learn everything you can. Once you know what you need to eat, make the change. And there's gonna be challenges associated with that. I'm, I'm quite sure for most people, it's not super easy, but if you stick with it, you can overcome these challenges. And then I ask you at some point, help others through these three steps. If you can get somebody else going through this process with you, that's awesome. But if you can't go through it yourself, as one of the doctors said, when you're in the hospital bed due to one of these food caused illnesses, it's not because of somebody else's choices, it's your choices. So save yourself first and then when you can help others. Here's uh, some things that I'm doing to try to help others. I made this website called uh, newsci.org, this nonprofit organization, the Nutrition Science Foundation, which is one of the two sponsors of this event. If you go to this website, newsci.org, you'll see on the front page, this button that says books and videos. If you click on that, you'll see reviews of what I think are the top, top video and top books uh, on this topic. Here's a documentary movie called Forks Over Knives, about 90 minutes, highly recommend that. Uh, the China study we've talked about, I, I would say is the best overall book on the relationship between food and, and illness and death. Here's a Spanish version of that. Prevent and reverse heart disease, we talked about. The first half is the science, including the study. The second half is a cookbook, awesome. Here's another one by John McDougall, the starch solution. Again, the first part is uh, the science and the second half is a cookbook. If you or somebody else you know has diabetes, you really need to get this book, Reversing Diabetes by Neil Barnard, great book. If you, after all this, if you think you might still want to eat some meat every now and then, uh, you might want to read this book written by a, a former cattle rancher who now won't eat meat. He found out how bad it was for you. If you want to just lose weight, The Plant Advantage is a good choice. Own Your Health is a fairly new book. It's kind of uh, some lighthearted parts in there about a very serious topic. Um, I, I highly recommend that one. And The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss by Chef AJ, again, a great book. And Better Than Vegan, uh, also a, a cookbook. So um, please uh, try one of those. Elsewhere on our website, the NUSI website, there's recipes of various kinds. Um, there's a doctor directory. You can put in your zip code and hopefully find one of the few doctors who really understands the uh, effect of nutrition on our health. If you need some motivation, we have some success stories, both in written form and some videos like the one that you saw at the beginning with Renee. And um, I, I'd ask you if, um, if you can, um, love to 
get a donation to help us uh, move NUSI forward some more. Uh, you can uh, donate through our website uh, with this uh, help us button at the very end. So what are some strategies for success here? First, you can go it alone. If, if you're a really self-motivated person, read one or more of these recommended books. And then here, here's, here's a way to go. Take your medical measurements before you make a big change so you know where your baseline is. Do a trial week of eating only these healthy foods. You won't like everything you try, but before you go all in, you want to really have a, a set of things that you're willing to eat. If you're doing the cooking for yourself, experiment with which one of these whole plant dishes or which ones of them you can easily cook and you like eating. And now you know what you're gonna eat, go all in. Do a 90 day challenge of only plants, none of these uh, animal products or oils. Uh, if you can't do 90, do 60. If you can't do 60, do 30. The psychiatrists or psychologists who, who look at this find that it's kind of a, an addiction thing. It's hard to wean yourself slowly off of cocaine. And for many people, it's hard to slowly wean yourself off of these unhealthy foods. Uh, some people can succeed at that, but for many, they need cold turkey. Go all in for a committed period of time. At the end of that time, take your measurements again. And if your weight is down, your cholesterol is down, your blood pressure is down, your blood sugar is down, your energy is up, maybe you can decide that you can do this for the rest of your life and that would be awesome. And then it's somewhere along the line, help others along this path. So that's the self-directed path. <clears throat> There's another path, which is a company called Little Green Forks, which is uh, one of the co-sponsors of this event here. Um, they deliver throughout the continental US. It's all of course, whole plant-based, no added oil. There's fresh greens and fruits. Uh, there's both uh, comfort foods and gourmet foods and environmentally packaged. Here are some of my favorite foods and, and I eat this stuff almost every day, uh, all of my meals. Uh, there's a burger with fries, no oil, a sweet potato bowl, which is awesome. Salads of various kinds, soups, pad thai. Here's a dessert that tastes like pumpkin pie, but it has no sugar and no, um, dairy products or eggs um, here. And let me end with this thought. 12 years after I ate the last one of these things, I look at this picture and it still appeals to me. And I talk to lots of people about how th this kills them. And, and some of them say, John, I understand that, but it just tastes so good that I, I'm willing to lose my life to continue eating those things. And I say, really? If you put this on a scale, you've got nothing in your life on the other side of that that's worth more to you than the cheeseburger? Really? I have something in my life that's worth more than all the cheeseburgers piled up to the sky. And that's my family, my wife and my three kids. It's, there's just no comparison. So I want to leave you with this thought. What do you have in your life that's worth more than a cheeseburger? Thank you. This event was brought to you by a combination of the Nutrition Science Foundation, New Sci, there's the website, and Little Green Forks, if you want to really eat healthy and very convenient delivery, uh, there's a website there. Thank you very much.